to tell you a story. And the story is a compilation of experiences in my life uh, based on pivots. And those pivots were caused from recognizing something, putting it together with something else, and then seeing yet a third concept develop. In 1985 to 1992, I hosted and produced, well, I produced and hosted a TV show in Los Angeles. It was a cable TV program, and I had guests on, and we talked about the future. I remember one guest, an engineer, invited me to his location in Burbank to test out his brand new battery for his energy efficient electric car. And I thought, wow, this is 1987, a little bit before the Tesla, so I was really excited. I had never driven an electric car. I didn't even know what one looked like. So on location, I went out and met the engineer, and I sat in the car behind the wheel, and I'm feeling really good about this. Lighting was good, the cameraman was in the right spot, my assistant was in the right spot. This is going to be a great show. And I sat there, and I sat there, and I looked over at him, finally, and he was kind of looking at me with a puzzled look on his face, and I said, well... And then he started laughing. I said, well, I don't know how to turn it on. I looked for it. There was no key. There was no fob. There was no, I, I couldn't find an on-off switch. I had no idea how to drive an electric car. And he looked at me and said, um, Natasha, the car's been on the whole time. It was incredible. It was so seamless, so smooth, so quiet. It was sensuous, supercharged. It ran so well. It was incredible, an incredible experience. That triggered an idea. I thought, hey, I'm going to do an ad campaign on a future body design that's seamless, stealth, sinuous, cyber forecast, turbocharged optimism, ageless. The most important thing was that it was smooth and seamless. Wow, I thought this would be great. And then I gave it some attributes there, error correction, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought this would be a great longevity vehicle. But it was an ad, it was a campaign, and it didn't have any chutzpah to it. It didn't have that, that, that grip. It didn't have the level of intelligence or research, rubric, or a rigor that was needed. So it was fun. It was a lot of fun to do. I thought about it a while. That idea of having the body as a vehicle really stayed with me. It is a vehicle. It takes us from one place to another. We need to check on it, replace some parts, update it, etc., to keep it healthy and moving. It is the only vehicle we have. So I thought, okay, in evolution, the trajectory is evolving over time and adapting to the environment. And as Dr. Lynn Margulis said in her book, What is Life? Life on Earth is more like a verb. It repairs, maintains, it creates, and sometimes it outdoes itself. Isn't that what we want for our longevity body? The vehicle? I did a little bit more research, and I thought, okay, so that's the history from anthropologists, archaeologists, those who have delved deeply into the history of our species, the Homo sapiens sapiens, from the Australopithecus to the human, the hominid, to where we are now. This is not the final stop. We're going someplace else. So where could that be? What might it be like? How can we learn from the archaeologists, the tools, the materials, the thinking, the patterns, the attitudes of people who survived over time. So I thought, okay, I'm taking this very seriously. I developed a team of scientists and engineers, Marvin Minsky of Artificial Intelligence, Ray Kurzweil of The Singularity and Innovation and Invention, 
Dr. Greg Fay for the MetaBrain and the cryobiology aspect of it, Dr. Max Moore for the philosophical and psychological aspect of a belief system, a behavior of extropy, of can-do. I also had Robert Friedis, who coined the term nanomedicine and actually wrote the first book on nanotechnology used in medicine, Eric Drexler, the father of nanotechnology, and others working on this project with me. They were my sounding board. I wanted this project to be as authentic and viable as possible. Now, mind you, this is still looking at the history about what was before us, but where we're going. And while these concepts within this longevity vehicle were not available at this time, in the late 1980s, 10 years after, I mean, the late 1990s, excuse me, 10 years after I sat in that energy-efficient vehicle. I wanted an energy-efficient vehicle. So if you look at this diagram, there's a metabrain, and there's the external layer of skin, and there's a smart skin that'll tell you, uh-oh, watch out, get out of the sun, the rays are too hot. You could have basal cell carcinoma, or the internal level of your organs, watch out, check the mitochondria, check this and that, pay attention to your body. So it had a streamlined cognitive panel going down the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system, out to an exoperipheral nervous system, letting us know through codes what's going on inside our body. Because most of the time, we don't know what's going on inside our body. And I thought that's one of the most important things we need to achieve, to listen to our body and be able to communicate with it effectively. I call this body emergent. It was incredible. It hit so many newspapers around the world. I was on so many TV shows and hundreds of documentaries. This went not only from Los Angeles, where I lived, but it went all over Europe, South America, Africa, um, Northern Europe. An unbelievable amount of press on this idea that was just an idea, actually. I hadn't built it, but it did have the MVP. It did have a minimal viable product. So. I had a proof of concept. Now, mind you, that concept was an idea that was before its time. If we look at where we are today, robotics with narrow AI, seamlessly integrating with haptic systems into our neurological center, so that if you have a prosthetic robotic arm, you can feel the heat of a cup of tea or the coolness of a lemonade. That is incredible. That the things we can do today with prosthetics, it's amazing. So if these bodies are faltering, and if the longevity escape velocity doesn't make it in time for us through bioengineering, then why not have an alternative body? Makes sense to me. So around that time, too, I started thinking, OK, a y where are we in science and technology? I can't build this yet. I can speak about it around the world and do lots of interviews and hoopla and all that. I wasn't making any money off of it. But it was great to have that behind me, but it wasn't enough. Something had to come about that would be even more exciting, more challenging. So I took a breath, and I thought, OK, a y what's on the horizon here? The year was 2002. Craig Venter had just sequenced the human genome. Pretty cool. OK, a y whoa, wait a minute. We still don't know what's going on in our genes. And then we found out it wasn't our genes, it's the proteinomics, not genomics. So then we get to that level, and then we have to dig a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little deeper. We still don't know. There's so many questions about what is going on in our bodies through our system, through our DNA. And I said, the hell with that, break it out. Let's break out of this Russian roulette genetic game of hereditary, that genes that are coming from our grandparents or from somewhere in our germline are transmitting genes that we may not want. So why are we getting them? We're not choosing our genes before we become little fetus, feti. We're not choosing our genes. They're given to us. They're provided to us. So I thought, OK, a y breakout. So this piece was called DNA Breakout. Each form of life 
has its own ability to develop its behaviors. And the behavior that we have today in our generation, what I call the ageless generation or the regen gen, have that option. We can do it any way we want. There's no right or wrong because we're all learning, we're all uncovering, we're all discovering. So, taking it a step further, I thought, okay, that's still not enough. I can do these graphic images, make videos, continue making my films, do everything I want to do in that regard. Backwards, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. But it's still not enough. I wanted to do something that would make a difference. Oh, this is on automatic, sorry. So I thought, okay, what hasn't been done before? Uh, uh, this is very funny, it's on automatic. This is like my genetic makeup, it's, telling, it's dictating to me what to do. So there's me in my lab. Um, Dr. Greg Fay was, oh, that's really funny. Um, Dr. Greg Fay was my, he brought me into 21st century medicine as a scholar to study, and I'm pipetting there under a hood. And there's my brain that I left in the room or somewhere I did 3D print it out and it's going to bring it, but it's, again, if you see it walking around, it, maybe it's in here. But here's some of my scientific research. What I did was I created a protocol based on previous research that had been qualified and print, uh, published. You must publish your scientific research. Ha you have to do it. And that's the good news because in order to have new scientific research, you build it from previous scientific research and you build on it. Just like working on a PhD, you build on what's already there and you create new knowledge. I wanted to create new knowledge in this. I just finished my PhD and I wanted to do this. So, uh, Dr. Fay taught me how to pipette and I did it really lousy at first. We killed lots of C. elegans. But what came out was, came up with um, a modality, methodology, a protocol that was brand new. And what we did was, we took hundreds of these beautiful C. elegant worms, we vitrified them and put them in cryonics, and we discovered that long-term memory persisted after being brought back, after revival. That these C. elegans are simple animals can be trained, they can remember a task through sound, audition, through smell, olfactory, through light, visual. They can retain information and perform the task again. It's rather Pavlovian. But I train these worms with my cohort in the lab to go to where the food was that had a certain smell. Then we vitrified them in cryonics brought them back, and the results were phenomenal. Long-term memory was preserved. Incredible research. Thank you. So Aubrey published it in his magazine. I had to have it blind peer-reviewed. It went through many iterations. Uh, writing a scientific paper is much different than writing a PhD dissertation. It's very difficult. So all you scientists out there, I mean, I'm humbly bow to you, it is really difficult work, um, but rewarding. So, okay, so that was, that was great. And I, that was enough for the time, but it's still not enough. So I started looking at what is the most important essential aspect of this longevity vehicle. And that's the body there. We've got our bodies, and we're taking care of them, and we're going to go to the RAD clinic, and we're going to do all these things that Bill Falloon is advising us to do, and our friends are helping us learn about. We're all learning together. But our mind, our brain is crucial. Unless your brain is healthy and your mind is alert and active. Okay, so I had an MRI of my brain, which was in the previous slide that my brain is trying to push. There's my brain. I 3D printed it. Um, so it's a, it's a large brain. A 3D printing of it is really incredible. I love the idea of it. And just think of that. Today, we can 3D print cells. We can 3D print organs. We can 3D print skin. We can 3D print prosthetic parts. This is amazing. So actually today, more than ever, it reflects back on my idea in the late 1980s and then brought it 
um, forward through more rigor, I suppose you would say, into the late 1990s of this longevity vehicle as our body. Today, I continue working on this with a focus on dementia and a focus on why do we lose cognitive abilities as we age, and all of us experience it at one time or another, we're going to have it. It's part of that disease of aging. Some of us earlier or sooner than others, but we must be kind, we must be generous, and we must be forgiving of each other if we forget something. Another thing is that we have to watch our behavior and also the care of our system. If this biological body is what we have, caring for it is the most important thing that we do. Now, that's the body and the mind. Stay active. Keep on thinking. Keep on learning. Go back to school. Learn new skills. Learn new tasks. Do something for 30 days that you never did before. Like me, if any of you out there know Marie Kondo, Marie Kondo, organizer, incredible genius. Well, my husband was watching a video of her, and I, sat, I walked by a couple of times, I sat down, and then I went in my bedroom, I threw everything out of my closet and my dresser into one big pile, and you pick it up and you go, okay, does it bring me joy? Yeah, yeah, I feel good in that. Over here, does it bring me joy? God, that was expensive, uh, Nordstrom's, not the rack, mm, designer section, oh, it does, doesn't feel good. Pass it on, let it bring someone else joy. So if we think like that in the things that we do in our lives, that will help us keep our brains healthy. A random act of kindness is one of the greatest things that we can do. Generosity, the more successful you become, the more generous you become, if your mind is clear. Yay, okay. So, one of the areas here is a social ecology, and this is very important. We are a society. Let's keep our society healthy. And let's help each other to be as healthy, mindfully as possible. If you hear some gossip shit, stop it. If you hear someone saying something, say, stop it, stop it now. You can leave the room, but that is kind of passive aggressive, right? It's better to just say, no, thank you, please. No. So, but there are times when you do need to say something. There are times where you do need to inform each other of something going on. I won't talk about it, but most of you in the audience know something that's recently gone on. And um, we all need to make sure that the people we're around are healthy, that people have us back. We don't have to love each other. Or sometimes we may not even like each other, but we're here together. We must, as humans, as transhumanists, respect each other. Yeah, okay, I got, yay. Okay, so let's put this story together. Okay, I had an idea. Seamless, supercharged, turbocharged optimism, streamlined, sensuous body. Woo. Like a sports car, like Bernie's sports car, but in silver. Okay, then it went into three MRI imaging of my own body density, bone mass, my brain and I reversed bone density loss, muscle loss in my own body through re-engineering re myself. That's another story. But through my mind, helping myself keep on learning and growing so that the dementia my mother had doesn't come as soon as it did for her. Putting it off by keep those neurons working, work it out, work our brains. And here you have that beautiful image of lighting up the brain when you have serotonin uptake. Whew when you have the dopamine, whew, positive thoughts. Whew. And there's my, my nematode worm there under the Petri dish. That's the one who came back after cryopreservation. Actually, she or the hermaphrodite came back and laid two eggs, and I thought I did a boo-boo. I thought I put bubbles in the Petri dish, and then I found out that she gave birth. One of the worms was actually pregnant. And after vitrification, after chronics, and I brought her back, warmed her up in the, in the warming bath and uh, revived her, or the hermaphrodite. She laid eggs, and I was looking at them and looking at them under the microscope, and they started moving. And then they came out of their little, you know, little cell thing, or what do you call it? And then they started swimming around. They were happy and healthy. It was 
one of the greatest moments of my life. So, all these narratives, these episodic experiences come together and create a story. And that story is the longevity vehicle. We don't know what it's going to become, but if the news is correct, and today I saw it, it said, transhumanism is the combination of the digital, the virtual, the electronic world, and the biological world. We could be digitized. Think about the avatars. Think of Martine Rothblatt and beingism. Think about what we could become if we have multiple bodies in multiple environments. Thank you.